everybody. My name is Don Mason. I'm happy to be your pastor. It's uh, welcome to worship here at First Congregational United Church of Christ here in Union City, Michigan. Uh, whether you're in person in the sanctuary, whether you're uh, online, uh, wherever you are, even if you're sitting there in your jammies, uh, welcome to our uh, worship service and we are so glad that you are part of this worshiping congregation because no matter who you are and no matter where you are in life's journey, you are welcome in this space and we are glad to be uh, part of your uh, religious experience this day. Uh, we know that people have had a variety of ways that they've experienced church throughout their lives and if you've had some rough spots along the way, we hope that this is a place where you can find a soft landing. Um, I would ask you to uh, take a few moments uh, through the course of the worship service to look at the announcements that are in your bulletin. Uh, we don't repeat a lot of the announcements that are in there uh, during our announcement time on Sunday mornings, but uh, because we trust that you can look at those and sort it out on your own. Uh, following the children's chat this morning, there will be uh, there will be a Sunday school class for the kids. There's also a nursery available, but please know that your children are welcome in the sanctuary as much and as long as you'd like them to be in the sanctuary. Uh, so uh, we love kids and we love the noise that they make. And, uh, and that means that our congregation has life within it. Um, the, uh, I, I, I have a thank you that I would like to uh, read to people. Uh, Dear First Congregational Church, thank you so much for the Valentine's Day treats and gifts. I appreciate you thinking of me and I will put all of them to good use at Michigan State University and that's Larson Kiever. Uh, thank you sincerely, Larson Kiever. Um, also, we've had uh, kind of a tragic week in the life of our congregation this week as uh, Sarah Converse, uh, uh, the, the, the Pete and Sarah's baby, uh, Ruby Grace, uh, died on Thursday morning uh, as they were trying to deliver the baby. And so our prayers for the Converse family are, uh, are great. And uh, if you would like to help out in some way with well, they're doing some coordination of dropping food off at the Converse's house this week. Kelly uh, and uh, Liz are kind of coordinating that. Uh, so if you want to uh, work with them on that schedule and stuff and uh, figuring out other ways that we can reach out to Sarah and Pete throughout the weeks ahead and to Emma and Levi, the older siblings as well. Um, but just please mainly keep Folks, in your prayers, it's been a tough week for them. I know it's been a tough week for many of us with our uh, with our power outages and other things like that. So uh, hopefully this morning we can find some time to just kind of snuggle together and stay warm together and experience the warmth of Christ's love at work in all of our lives because that's truly why we are here the most. Uh, and uh, and again, any questions, any issues, any problems, don't hesitate to get in touch with me as your pastor, and we can work on those kinds of things all together. Uh, you can see the schedule in the, in the bulletin, but let's, uh, let's begin with uh, the ringing of the bell. Actually. Oh, yeah, Deb has a mission moment, he sorry. Knew, but he just I forgot, forgot for a minute. minute. Good morning. I'm and thank Deb. you, Deb, for, for playing the, sure. the music. Yeah, course. it wasn't going to come. <laughs> uh, I'm representing Shalom Board this morning, and we have a mission moment on community action. Uh, we used to do the Walk for Warmth this weekend, and they don't come down here anymore. They still hold it certain places. I'm not sure exactly where. But we would, uh, we're just encouraging. Shalom Board is giving some money, and if anybody else would like to give, uh, they are a wonderful, a wonderful organization. They are dedicated to helping people achieve and maintain independence. 
They have a community and family engagement leader and they work on Head Start. They have a Head Start program. They have childcare for low income families. They have parenting classes. They supply commodities for low income seniors, for low income people of all ages. They have a variety of sites that they go to, 14 to 16 boxes per family per year. Uh, they also have emergency food. They have transportation within Calhoun County. They can go to the doctor, to work, grocery store, socializing, etc. It's critical to keep uh, older people active and independent. They have adult education. You could obtain your GED through them. They do the foster grandparents program. We've had those grandparents in our school systems here. Uh, I remember my children just love those um, grandparents in their rooms and it's a, a triple win. It's a win for the teacher, for the children, and for the person who is serving as a foster grandparent. They weatherize houses, they work on lead safety, veterans' families, uh, they still do the walk for warmth. I know they do it in cold water, I'm not sure anything else, but um, it, it just gave me delight looking at their website and seeing all the many things they do. So feel free to go to Community Action on your computers. Um, they help uh, heat bills for elderly, low income, and disabled people. So vital services for our communities, they serve many counties and also vital for servicing Jesus and the many ways that we can be the hands and feet of God in this world. So please pray about if that's something you want to give money to. Uh, you can put it in the plate, uh, make the check out to the church. Uh, you can send it in, anybody who's online, you can send it in in the mail, uh, or I'm sure Pastor Don would just take it if you handed it to him. And uh, make it out to the church, and then the church will send a big uh, whatever amount of money to community action. Thank you so much. insert in the bulletin that we will be reading from for the, uh, uh, is there an insert? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure we're reading for the, 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 the first week of Lent, the, uh, the joy of salvation purposes, uh, and you can join me in that. 
those the, the, the words will be spoken this week. Uh, they will be sung when Emma's back at the organ. So uh, you may stand and join with me in the call to worship. Jesus said to James and John, follow me, and they followed him. When we follow the leader, we go where he calls us to go. For the joy before him, Jesus sojourned on to the cross that was grim for salvation won. We don't have those words. We, do. we don't have those words? Okay, let's start over again. Is this, yeah, this is, this is the bulletin insert, right? Oh, it's a different. Oh. I thought so. Well, we're going to do this again. Because I was wondering why nobody was speaking. Okay. <laughs> For the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the of our faith. For the joy before him, Jesus sojourned on to the cross that was grim for salvation one. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. God has sent us into the world with a purpose and a plan. In Jesus, we have hope and a future. Let us pray as Christ prayed in Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done, O Father. Jesus fulfilled the prompt purpose of God by preaching and teaching, healing and performing miracles, forgiving and receiving sinners. Our purpose is to serve as imitators of Christ, sharing the gospel message, loving, helping, and forgiving others in his name. As disciples of Christ this Lent, we follow him to Jerusalem to praise him as our King. We follow him to the upper room, where he demonstrated that he came not to be served, but to serve. We go to Calvary, where he gave himself into death for us. We stand outside the empty tomb, where his purpose came to life for him and for us forevermore. Let us ever walk with him. For a purpose Christ came to achieve God's plan. We live on in his name. Hail the Son of Man. And note at the bottom of the insert, there are uh, daily readings that we can share during the week. So uh, please take this home and continue to uh, use this as part of your Latin discipline. children that wish to spend a little time talking to me this morning to come up and do so at this time. There comes Ava. And, uh, if you're the only taker, I'm glad to have you, Ava. How you doing? Oh, there comes, there comes Charlotte, little baby Charlotte. 
is there somebody in your daycare named Charlotte? And then there comes baby Charlie and Max. Yeah. All right. So we got we got a good little group here. How you guys doing? You guys doing good? All right. Um, one of the things that uh, that I didn't know if if you noticed yet, but um, we have purple today. You like purple? Yeah, purple is we got purple on the on the the lectern, we've got purple on the pulpit, we've got the purple banners up, we've got a purple cloth draped on the cross. Do you see that? Because we've entered a new season of church life, and it's called Lent. Yeah. Now, did you ever Lent anything to anybody? <laughs> <laughs> did you, did you lend them, uh, lend somebody something to eat, or uh, lend them, them your crayon so that they could color, or did you lend, no, that's not how Lent goes. That's not what Lent's about. All the grown-ups are laughing because they think I'm silly talking about Lent like that. Lent is a time when we're trying to figure out how God wants us to live our lives. And that's something that's true every week, right? That, that we're trying to figure out how God wants us to live our lives. I, I know. <laughs> but, uh, but during Lent, we, take, we pay more careful attention to it because um, we're building our way up to the most important um, holiday of the Christian life, and that's Easter Sunday. And because Easter Sunday is so important to all of us, yes, Easter Sunday is very important, yes. But because Easter Sunday is so very important to us, it, it takes longer to get ready for Easter Sunday than it does the other Sundays of the year. You know, and, and we come to worship on Sundays, and this is the first Sunday of Lent, and we've got five more Sundays between now and Easter Sunday. Uh, and each of those Sundays, we're going to be thinking of new ways that we can, uh, we can order our lives and we can connect ourselves with Jesus in, in new ways. And so, uh, uh, I know, I'm so distracted by these beautiful babies. <laughs> I learned something. What did you learn? So everybody in here, when they were babies, they all had blue eyes. Everybody. The babies all had blue eyes. Or brown. <laughs> or green. No? They are, okay. And, and where did we learn this? Uh, I learned it from some higher school. You learned it at school. Okay. Because when they get older, they, the eyes decide what color they want to be. Oh, the eyes decide what, what color they want to be. There. So, so you're born with, with, with eyes that are very, you know, that, that, that are one color but then they they have a tendency to grow and change and maybe have different di oh, different pa i did not know that i did not know that and uh do, do you, how long does it take for that to happen do you know is that more of your science understanding or not 40 days that's what i'm guessing <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Huh, that's an interesting idea. But I, I know we've got little, a uh, couple little blue-eyed girls here, and, and brown-eyed Ava, and brown-eyed Max, and brown-eyed Amber. Some people look at my eyes and they say, oh, your eyes are greenish, bluish, brownish. But when they say, well, they look like brown. Because mine are hazel. Yours are hazel, so they're greenish, bluish, brownish. <laughs> I like it. I like it. And um, and one of the things that one of the things that I know, Miss Charlie. One of the. What are you going to say something too? I know you want to play with the baby. I know you guys can go to the nursery and play together a lot. I'm sure. But uh, as we get ready for Easter Sunday, and as we think about. Let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run with that idea, that we look at each other in the eyes during the time of Lent this season. Because you can't tell 
you can't tell a whole lot of, about somebody by the way their eyes look. But it's a good place to look when you're talking to them so that you can see if they're understanding what you're saying and so that you can see if, if, if they're, you know, somebody that you can, that, that, that you can trust and somebody that you, wanna, that you wanna learn from. And so when we're in this Lenten season and then over the next 40 days, we're gonna be trying to learn how to face ourselves in the mirror, look at ourselves in the eyes, because that's what God wants us to do. But God also wants us to, uh, to, to recognize that we don't do everything perfectly all the time. And all the things that we know and all the things that we say uh, are, are challenging and difficult sometimes. And so Lent is when we're trying to organize all those ideas about Jesus into what are we gonna do, to, how are we gonna celebrate Jesus on Easter Sunday? that's gonna help us to be uh, really faithful and good and honest and loving Christians. And so uh, it's a hard job and, and focusing on that for the next 40 days though, I think is gonna be an important thing to do. So let's pray. Dear God, yeah. help me grow closer to you over the next 40 days. Over the, next 40 months, over the next 40 months, and over the next 40 years. Over the next 40 years. Grant us your presence, Amen. your love, your love. And, your peace. and your peace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Now we've got to teach these littlest ones how to pass the peace. And then we're going to sing a song, right? Yeah, we're going to, I know, pass the peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. I receive the past <laughs> peace of Christ. Peace be with you. Thank you. And also with you. Good job. Peace be with you, Max. <laughs> second chapter and the third chapter. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For on the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. 
But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. <laughs> then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. <clears throat> but they didn't die. Okay. And from Matthew, the fourth chapter, the first 11 verses. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, God will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So once more, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly... Angels came and waited on Jesus. May God add a blessing to our hearing and understanding of this, the Holy Word of God. Amen. As of today, we have 37 days and 5 Sundays left in Lent. Now, the 40 days of Lent is counted without Sundays because Sundays... You don't have to fast. If you fasting from chocolate for Lent, you don't have to fast on Sundays. You can have a bite of chocolate on Sundays that way. In between, you don't have to suffer so much. Uh, <laughs> just say it's not cheating to have a piece of chocolate on Sunday if you're giving up chocolate for Lent. It's a theological principle that's at work. Okay. For some people, it's going to be easier just to completely forget about it for the whole 45, 46 days, whatever. But for some, that might help you get through your Lenten discipline and make you think a little bit more about the things that you do and don't do during the course of your Lenten journey. Uh, I know uh, I didn't give up chocolate. For Lent. So I don't have to worry about that. I didn't give up eating anything for Lent. Uh, I did decide that I want to try and take on a few things during Lent. And so 
that's the, that's the more important discipline that I'm trying to get to today, is that discipline of, of being more engaged in my prayer life, being more, uh, more attentive to reading the scriptures and being a little bit more uh, creative in the ways that I'm approaching my Lenten discipline, if you will. And today, one of the reasons that we have this 40-day period that we, uh, that we talk about is, we, is because that was a common thing in Jesus' day as a means of self-discipline, to do a 40-day fast. You know, Jesus, they talk about in Matthew, Jesus being led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be and the first thing it says that it's gonna, that's going to happen is Jesus is going to be tempted by the devil. He's going off into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And the first thing he does is he fasts for 40 days. Now we, uh, oftentimes when we read this, our brain turns it around a little bit. And we say, well, Jesus went off into the desert and was, temp was, was fasting for 40 days. And then decided to go confront the devil because he had gone through this spiritual discipline. And, but it says in the gospel here that he went to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And then the first thing that he did was fasted for 40 days. And at the end of those 40 days, you know, what's the expectation, right? The expectation is he's ready to do battle with the devil. He's ready He's got a spiritual load inside of himself that he's just gonna, he's just gonna battle the devil. He's gonna overcome all those temptations. He's gonna be strong and he's gonna be wise and he's gonna be smart and he's gonna be even a little sassy and confident when he goes in there to, to, to deal with the devil because he's just gonna put him away that easy and that quick. But it says, at the end of those 40 days, what does it say Jesus was? He was famished. He was hungry. He was human at the end of those 40 days. Even though he had this sense of purpose, understanding this connection with God, this inseparable part of Jesus that was divine, he still had his human body that needed to have its food available to it. And he was famished. How do you vanquish evil on an empty stomach? Well, here's a, an example from Jesus. But uh, oftentimes, when we start talking about sin, when we start talking about um, temptations, we come back to this Bible story that we used to set it up, this story from Genesis, right? Of uh, the man and the woman, it doesn't name them as Adam and Eve. Eve isn't even named as a person's name until the end of this Genesis story. And she's only named so once. It's just the man and the woman that are in the garden. Um, they weren't hungry. They certainly weren't fasting. They had everything they needed. They were there in the garden. Their needs are met. Beautiful plants and animals of every sort had to be climate controlled. They were naked. They didn't even want to have clothes on. Didn't need clothes. Didn't need anything. Doesn't even say that they built a house. Those first generations of names of people that, that, they, uh, that, that they did, it wasn't like Survivor, where the first thing you do is build shelter. You know, start chopping down those trees and making the leaves and the fronds and the roof. No, they didn't need any of that stuff. They were well taken care of. All they had to do was reach out, pick the fruit. 
All they had to do was walk around and be free. They were very well fed and they were comfortable in their own skin. But then they met their first adversary. Now, the adversary is not a person in this story. The adversary in this story is a talking snake, a serpent, the craftiest of all the wild animals. Not Satan. Not an embodiment of evil in human form, but a snake, a wild animal. A talking snake, also. And not the only occasion where animals talk to humans in the Bible. I have another story later on about Balaam and his donkey, right? Um, But the snake showed them that they might be missing something. Now, isn't that just like human beings? To have everything that you need, to have everything lined up and perfect. You know, it's just everything's going, having a good day, and then all of a sudden, it just all falls apart because you realize, well, you know, even though my belly's full, even though I'm pretty warm, even though I've got a roof over my head, even though the, uh, the, the electricity came back on for some, still hasn't come on, back on for everybody yet, but even though all these things are lined up and life is pretty dang on good, uh, I just have this sneaky suspicion that it might not be everything. And I can see that, you know, I like that burgundy shirt that Mark's wearing. I don't have a burgundy shirt like that. I, uh, you know, I, 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 I love those shoes she has on them. And I don't have any shoes like that. Or, man, I, you know, could really stand a great big Jamocha milkshake. I don't need it, but it would taste good. And those things aren't harmful, necessarily. Because since Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, we've grown a sense of modesty that we really don't want everybody run around naked. We live in environments where that's really impractical. Uh, in, this, uh, in this part of Michigan, <laughs> it would be very impractical. Uh, I think you would get used to it, but... <laughs> Humans are very adaptable, but it's really not necessary, and it's an awful thought for some of us to think about seeing all these other bodies without the clothes on. I, I don't, I don't want to go there, and you definitely want to stay away from those thoughts with me for sure. Um, but the thing that, the the, the thing that the serpent pointed out that was most important. And this, my friends, is where we have to realize that all of these stories are written years and years and years afterwards, okay? So what we're doing is we're using the, the, these, these stories are very important to our spiritual lives because they explain one big idea. And that big idea is that if God created this world and God was such a, God created everything good. Remember that? You know, at the end of every level of creation, God said, this is good. 
Adam and Eve said, this is good. The people that were there said, oh, this is nice, wonderful, comfortable. It's good. So if that's the case, why didn't it stay good? What is it about the world that changed? Because if God created it good, shouldn't it just stay good all the time? And shouldn't we be able to have just good, 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 and no bad? Shouldn't there always be good constantly available for all of us? Shouldn't we always have love in our lives and in our hearts? Shouldn't we always, everybody, have food enough on their tables? Shouldn't we all have comfort, be safe in our own skin? So why is there evil in the world? Why are there things that aren't good? Well, <sighs> instigated by the animals, the humans blew it. Wrecked it for everybody else. And that's what this story is meant to tell. Humans came into the world as a created version of God, good to the bone. But it wouldn't last even beyond the first generation of human beings. So with the introduction of humans into God's perfectly good world, that's where evil came in. And the serpent said, but can't you see that tree? That tree with the good fruit on it? That's going to help you choose whether something's good or something's evil. That's going to help you gain the knowledge that you need to pronounce something good or bad. And I think both the man and the woman's minds were blown because they said, everything's been good up to this point. Why do we need to introduce bad into the joint? Crafty. The author of this section of scripture wasn't trying to describe the actual historical events of the day in the garden. The author was trying to apologize about how humans could be given so much at the beginning of their existence and how God's created order could be so completely good but they just couldn't keep that one rule. Don't eat from that one tree. And once that was pointed out to them, hungry or not, they had to try it and learn to do evil or God's created order could never have come to the ruin that it's in right now. That's one of the things that we know. If God had created a perfect world, a perfect order for things, a, perfect, a perfectly good existence for all humans in this world, in which we've had it pretty good, but our need to have more just wrecked it for everybody else and everything else. From the very beginning. Now, where's the hope? <laughs> the hope comes when we read Jesus' story of temptation. And when we examine this next story of understanding, because Jesus came, again, fit and filled, right? Jesus had just been baptized. Jesus had just been around with John's followers. He was just starting to get a following. 
just starting to become this religious leader that promised a new good, a new perfection, a new completion of the created order. Jesus came into the world to right all those wrongs that had been done by human beings over the course of thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Jesus comes along, fit and filled and ready. So what does he do? Does he just go in there and start beating up on the devil? No. He decides to go empty. Go fast. Don't come to the devil with a full belly, with a full wallet, with a full house. Come to the devil when you're empty and empty yourself in front of him because then is when you have the opportunity to let God fill those differences. Jesus came to his time of trial and temptation when he was well aware of the difference between good and evil and he was famished. And so what's the first thing that he was tempted with? You're hungry. <laughs> Take this rock. You can make it into bread. Just do it. Simple. Like that. You can do it. God will do that for you. If you ask for a fish, God will give you a fish. God won't give you a stone. If you ask for a piece of bread, God will give you bread. I won't give you rocks and pebbles. He said, no thanks. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that God preaches. By every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then he said, okay, well, you know, God's going to protect you. So if you want to throw yourself off of the temple, and I've said this before, and this is one of my favorites, um, just throw yourself off, you'll be fine. And Jesus said, no, there's steps. There's stairs. <laughs> That's the smart way down. I don't have to test God by throwing myself off of the top of the temple. And say, okay, God, I'm going to prove that, that you love me by throwing myself off of the temple and you'll make me not get hurt, right, God? Please, God, please, please don't let me fall and break my neck. And no, Jesus said, no. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. There's steps, there's an elevator, there's ways down. You don't have to do that. You don't have to trust God that way. And he says, okay. This is the one that will get you though, right? I'll get you right where the greed hits. And that is, I'll give you unbelievable wealth. More of everything and anything, everything in the whole world, all of it. And that's where, again, Jesus said, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And Jesus passed the test. Uh, do we? When our, when we are, don't have our sensibilities offended by the advertising moguls that say, I want it all, I want it all, I want it now, and you have to have it now. No. Friends, that is one of the, why, one of the ways that uh, 
that we need to use this knowledge of the difference between good and evil that we have received. We need to use this knowledge to discern what is good and what is evil. And we need to express that in the habits that we follow as we try and acknowledge that we are being tempted and overcome that temptation. With our faithful response, emptying ourselves so that they can be filled with God. Because that's what Jesus did. That's the example that Jesus would invite us to follow. Not throw up our hands and say, well, everybody else does this, so why not me? <laughs> or what about, well, you, you, think, uh, you think what I did was not right? Well, what about what she did that's not right? What about what he did that's not right? When we are tempted, We come to our time of trial and temptation and we overcome it by growing closer to God and closer to one another by acknowledging that the way of the world is not the way that leads us to being saved and completed, but that the way of the world may come by accepting less and not wanting more. I know that's not easy to hear, and it's definitely not easy to do. But we know that there is a difference. And we can tell that there is a difference between what we see as good and what we see as evil. And when we act on those things, we are overcoming the temptations that Satan puts before us. Let's move on from this space. And let's carry these words that we're about to read with us because they help us to recognize and to acknowledge ways that God has placed truth in our lives. Uh, so if you'll stand with me and turn in your hymnal to page 300, to number 361, the United Church of Christ Statement of Faith. And read that with me, if you will. We believe in you, O God, eternal Spirit, God of our Savior Jesus Christ and our God. And to your deeds we testify. You call the worlds into being create persons in your own image, and set before each one the ways of life and death. You seek in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. You judge people and nations by your righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Savior, you have come to us and shared our common lot conquering sin and death, and reconciling the world to yourself, you bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. You call us into your Church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be your servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world, to resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. You promise to all who trust you forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, your presence in trial and rejoicing, 
and eternal life in your realm, which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto you. Amen. talked a little bit about some for whom we're praying today. Uh, I invite you to continue with those thoughts and prayers for those persons for uh, a variety of other needs and causes throughout the world, uh, particularly uh, those who have been experiencing some of the violence of life in the previous weeks uh, and uh, and uh, especially the, the violent headlights, head, headlights that we keep seeing around the world. Let's uh, keep praying that, uh, that we can figure out other ways to deal with our uh, disputes and our differences than, uh, than resorting to violence in the world. Uh, during the course of the prayers, there will be a, an opportunity at which you may lift up voices, lift up your voices in uh, naming the names of persons for whom you're praying today as well. So Christ, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Gracious God, you touch and bless our lives in so many different ways. 
You honor us with your presence. And you have given us this created order in which we can be discerning of the goods of life and the bads of life. And that we can honor you by accomplishing those good things for ourselves and for each other, for you and for the world. Grant us your presence. Grant us your love. Visit us with truth. Help us to be seekers of understanding. Help us to carry your message to a world that is hurting. And help us to be agents of healing. Loving God, we know that you can be all things to us. And so we ask that you would visit particular attention to those whose names we lift up at this time. Most gracious God, we thank you that even before we issue our prayers, you begin to provide the answers. You show us the truth. You grant us your presence. And you give us one another to tend to, to love, and to honor. So go with us beyond these walls today as we set out on our journeys, our journeys home, our journeys to you, our journeys toward that precious day of resurrection. It still seems rather far, but we know we'll come before we expect it. So walk with us down the paths we follow through Jesus Christ who taught us that we can pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Rejoicing in the created order of God and rejoicing in the salvation of Christ that is yours to receive. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.